how do women figure for example when say policy makers ministers try to make policies regarding economic development or social development are women's lives and realities adequately captured um are they uh, twisted and warped in one way or the other right you know when i started my field work and when i would ask women so what did you do with the loan of say 500 rupees they would say saap to we ate the loan so as my mother's health took a turn for the worse i became really interested in understanding who she had been and how she had lived her life mm. and this was as her memories faded she was a feminist a women's movement activist a trade unionist a communist leader and um, i was gripped by this anxiety to preserve and record her stories as a way of coming to terms with uh, losing mm. her in this really meaningless manner Hello everyone uh, and welcome to another episode of Rahi Impact Journeys. Today I am delighted to bring a conversation with Professor Kalpana Karunakaran, a professor in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Madras. So Professor Kalpana's work spans many worlds uh, where she delves into uh, gender issues, looking at microcredit, at manual labor, and in all of this there is a personal spin to many elements of her research as well. So I'm looking forward to this conversation and learning more about her and her work. So let's dive in. So ma'am, uh if for everyone's benefit you could just help with an introduction of yourself. Absolutely. Um so I've been working at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences for the last uh, 13 years and my research like you very rightly said the uh, Girish is in the area broadly of development studies. but looking at the interfaces between gender and the development experience hmm. so basically trying to understand um, how do women figure for example when say policy makers ministers try to make policies regarding economic development or social development are women's lives and realities adequately captured um are they uh, you know uh, twisted and warped in one way or the other right so these are some of the questions that we broadly uh grapple with in this domain that we call gender and development which is okay. also where i locate myself and my work okay and the teaching of course my teaching in iit madras is in the broad space of development studies so that's not only limited to uh gender or women studies but my research is broadly in the space of uh, gender it. and women studies got it and how did you get here i mean if you could just trace a little bit of your journey to this topic this research area and more broadly into humanities right 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 so i must say i got here because i had absolutely no pressure from my parents to either study engineering or medicine okay right and uh, in that sense my upbringing was quite different um, my parents just allowed me to do whatever be whatever and i think i naturally gravitated towards the social sciences really i was this uh, book reading nerd kid I loved history. History was one of my favorite subjects till class 10 and then I think in class 11 and 12 it was economics. Um so it was the one thing I did know about myself was that I wanted to do a masters in uh in JNU then. Right. Uh and uh, that's where I did a masters in the department of in the Center for Historical Studies CHS. Right. So it was a masters in modern Indian history. And um two years after my uh, masters or no actually for about 5 years after my masters i got back the moment i got back to tamil nadu once my masters was done i began to work uh, fairly uh, intensively in the development sector and once again the inspiration for that i think came from both my parents but really my mother uh, who was herself a very strong inspiring activist in the women's movements in the trade union movements a very well loved and revered leader mm. michael iswaraman was her name so i grew up really in a household in which issues to do with uh, women's rights labor rights uh, social movements for political change for social justice or gender justice were very much a part of our everyday conversations um amma used to have her young friends come home very often and uh, conversations would spill over uh, after night early mornings etc and i really grew up in this household in which uh, 
ideas were being constantly discussed and debated and I think that was a big formative influence on me and it sort of made me who I am and also it became a almost a natural decision to take a break after my master's mm. and to spend about five years completely working with a volunt voluntary organization uh, which is part of the people science movement, uh, the All India People Science yeah. Network. So in Kerala, for instance, it's the Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad. Mm. In Tamil Nadu, it's the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Right. And so these are not really um, NGOs in the sense of, you know, constituting uh, proper professional NGOized jobs. Mm. Uh, uh, these are really people's movements that uh, draw people from a spectrum of uh, occupations. Um, and uh, I uh, began to work really from 97, I think the uh, end of 97, with this federation of self-help groups, women's self-help groups, microcredit groups in Kanyakumari district then. Okay. It was a fairly massive presence in the district and uh, also organized by, supported by the Science Forum, the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. And then of course, like I said, I had complete parental permission to explore um, and to not necessarily be earning anything at all mm. and to have no marriage pressure on me. For that matter, no pressure to even then think of a PhD or think of the thing I want to do next, right? right. That one has a sense that life must go in a certain direction, no? To a leading always towards settling down, right? So I, I just had. never had that pressure okay. or that expectation, right? So that's how I arrived in Kanyakumari district and, um, and then one thing led to it to another and uh, I began to work really uh, in helping the Tamil Nadu Science Forum create equally strong, equally vibrant women self-help group federations mm. uh, in the other districts of Tamil Nadu, especially in the southern districts. So really Madurai, Virudhanagar Mavattam, Sivaga, Sivagangai and then in the north it was uh, Velur, mm. Samtrichi. So there was a lot of traveling involved mm. uh, during that period, traveling mostly within Tamil Nadu. And then I also be, uh, got involved with a with a people's health movement. So that was the year that um, you know the year two thousand was mm. to go back to the Alma Ata Declaration. Right. There was this declaration that there must be health for all. That governments must deliver health to all citizens by the year two thousand. But the year two thousand was upon us, and where was health for all? Mm. So the Tamil Nadu Science Forum was part of an all India network of many civil society actors, all of whom were asking this question about. Where are people's health rights? And uh, what was, the, can, can you help me with the background of this that you mentioned? Uh, the Alma Ata Declaration mm -hmm. was when, um, uh, 1978, I think, if I haven't got the okay. year wrong, mm -hmm. was when governments, health ministries uh, signed on to this idea that they have a, this charter really, right. that they have an obligation to, to deliver absolute, uh, you know, a complete health care to all citizens, irrespective of their ability to pay for it or not, by the year 2000. So there was a timeline as well. It was right. not just, you know, a wish expressed like that. Right. Uh, and, and also this notion that, you know, health, demanding one's health rights was really part of citizenship rights or social citizenship mm. rights. And that's also what a welfare state means, uh, that health, education, basic primary health, uh, preventive health, promotive health, at the same time as education as well, are uh, part of governmental obligations to its every citizens, citizen. to every citizen. Got it. Um, so the Tamnath Science Forum became an important part of this, a leading uh, member of this uh, campaign, the Health for All campaign. I jumped into it and then I worked uh, the next couple of years, both in SNGs and in organizing action around women's health. Um, mm. and also monitoring primary health centers for the quality of services that they deliver, monitoring people's health status, etc. So all of this was for the first five years full time mm. after I was done with my master's. Okay. And then the PhD bug got me in the end. Without right? any external pressure, you <laughs> wanted it. <laughs> this time I wanted it. Okay. So I sort of knew that I wanted it when when I just felt that this is the time that I mm. must do a PhD mm. and I don't want to go to my grave with this unfinished agenda. Uh, um, if I may, what was that please, motivation? Please. Like, uh, was it was it a personal ambition that I want a PhD or was right, it that I'm right, missing right. something because I don't have a PhD? What was there? If you can think back to that. So I think I did want to, uh, let me put it this way. I did want to understand my experience better. 
mm. right? Um, so the, even to just give you an example of the SNGs, no, it was the dominant narrative is that uh, women uh, um, um, organize into these neighborhood based groups, they save money, they open bank accounts, and then they start micro enterprises, mm -hmm. the loans get repaid, uh, and then women empower themselves by picking themselves up, you know, yeah. by bootstrapping themselves, literally, uh, out of poverty. Right. Um, so that's the dominant narrative, right? But then I saw so many little interesting twists in this tale, right? Mm. Um, I saw, for instance, that uh, uh, women who, for some reason, or the other could not save, could not repay their loans because there was a family crisis, they had lost a breadwinner in the family or there was some other collapse of livelihoods and incomes, uh, felt that there was no place for them in the group, right? Um, so there was because a, they couldn't be productive because they couldn't be economically uh, part of this logic of relentless saving and relentless repayment of loans. Okay. Mm. And so there was a sense of shame, uh, right? That I'm no longer, uh, that I can't be this fiscally, uh, you know, responsible, responsible. Uh, micro credit saver and borrower hmm. and women who are really in very dire vulnerable circumstances because of these crises up. were either pushed out of the groups or they uh, voluntarily Dropped exited up. right, right? Hmm. so uh, so that then became this question of what is this dynamic which is also about which is the space for women to gather to share jokes with each other uh, to to really develop strong friendships and women would look forward to this meeting once a week but for that woman who seemed to need the solidarity and the sisterhood mm. and the space of collective gathering the most uh, she couldn't be part of this space anymore mm. right so the space seems to be inclusive but there is at the heart of it a dynamic a logic that is exclusionary Interesting. Mm. so that became one of the questions that was intriguing for me Mm. Uh, and uh, the other, of course, was the kind of pressure that bankers were constantly exerting on women because, you know, you know the promise of the self-help group is financial inclusion. And that meant the link with India's vast network of public sector banks, the nationalized banking sector. So when women would, had their own savings, they would be knocking on the doors of banks saying, now you give us loans, mm. right? Uh, in fact, this is what, uh, Girish, I really liked about self-help groups, the fact that it was like a sangam, hmm. right? So banks would uh, could ignore uh, women, especially of uh, rural land poor right. households earlier, right? But now that they were organized into this union, into this grassroots collective of 20, 25 women, uh, they could actually legitimately knock on the doors of banks right. and say, you can't ignore us anymore, right? right. But so while that is again part of this happy narrative about hmm. SHGs, um, the reality was far more uh, complex. Nuanced. Uh, because bankers would use the fact that women wanted their loans to say, ah, so they you want a loan now, seat. give us, return the loan that your father-in-law took from my bank 10 years ago and that your husband took from my bank 7 years ago and that your son took from my bank, you know, and right. then we'll think about giving you your loan, right? Right. So there was a way in which I found that for all this talk of empowerment of women, SNGs were really caught in these very unequal power dynamics hmm. uh, between far more powerful bankers and the hmm. bank as an institution and their own informal grassroots collectives. Hmm. So that became another part of the story that I was interested in studying. Fascinating. Uh, right. So I think that organically, once again, the process was organic. I don't think it was so much personal ambition that I must have a PhD now. Um, but it was a question of, so there are all these stories and I love storytelling, right? Yeah. Uh, so why can't I think of a way in which these stories feed into a larger piece of writing about SAJs that Got I it. felt I was ready to do. Right. And that writing became the PhD. Got it. Maybe because I was also a young person looking to get into formal systems. Of course. So, right. Got it. And so where did you do your PhD? From the Madras Institute of Development Studies mm. in uh, Chennai in Adyar. Hmm. And uh, that's a development uh, institution, uh, research, very, very serious social sciences research institution. Uh, being located in Chennai, it allowed me to retain my links to all the groups right. that I had been working with, the health rights groups, the other civil society groups, the labor rights groups, and then, of course, the women's self-help groups. Right. Uh, I was very worried. I remember this. I remember. I can think back to this uh, at the moment of starting my PhD because then I was Kalpana, K Kalpana, Tamil Nadu Science Forum and I was known in this world. That right? was your identity. That was yeah. my identity. That's how I thought of myself. Yeah. And I was afraid that becoming uh, a uh, scholar once again, becoming a student once again, I would lose this identity. 
and I wasn't uh, I was nervous about that mm -hmm. I must say I was apprehensive so that's why I sort of thought I remain wherever whatever happens there's a PhD if it happens it happens in my mm -hmm. city in right. my state so I continue to travel I continue to cultivate my links with these groups mm. and I don't feel like I've lost anything in the process of getting a PhD. Got it. But so, you also planned it in that way so it yes, stays in Yes, yes, yes. And as it happened, the Madras Institute of uh, Development Studies had their, their interviews and I got in. Right, right, right. Yeah. Nice. And then? Yeah. So. And, um, and then, um, so my PhD was on, once again, self-help groups, asking questions. Um, a part of my journey was also to figure out that while I thought I knew the field very well, because, mm. you know, often in a PhD, um, scholars are PhD scholars, PhD researchers are introduced to the field as part of the PhD. So then they do the conceptual, you know, readings, the theory, right, the right. theory first, and then they take their exams and then the field. Whereas for me, it was a completely different story. Yeah. You no, know, I, I had been this organizer. I had been this leader in the science forum. I was also one of uh, some of the women less than 30 years of age who had, who had risen within the organization. We were among the state office bearers. Right. I was one of the state secretaries and I was one of the state vice presidents, etc. Right. So I had a very strong sense of myself, both as a um, young activist in the science movement and of the field in which I had gained all this experience. Right. Mm. So the field was not new to me, really. Mm. Even so, even so, I must say, uh, one thing about this journey into both activism and research at the same time is there are surprises along the way all the time, hmm. right? So I did go, once I withdrew from the field and did all the reading that I needed to do around microcredit, uh, state developmentalism, etc, etc, and went back to the field, I found that um, there's a way in which I'd frame my research questions. Hmm. But what I was seeing was something that was, of course, very interesting, but pointing to another story. So in a sense, mm. my larger narratives got hijacked by the field. <laughs> okay. Tell you, us more. Can I explain Yeah, that? please. Yeah, yeah. So I think I was asking this question about, um, so what is really happening with enterprises? So the story is women are using their loans to start tiny businesses. And then they're, you know, like I said, picking their families up and out of poverty. Right. Is that really happening? Mm. And then I found that uh, I found something else in the field entirely, which is a fascinating story, which is that, so there was this enterprise loan then called the Swarna Jayanti Gram Swarozgar Yojana from mm. 99 to 2011. Mm. And that was a scheme that was supposed to provide loans with a subsidy component to women's self-help groups. The expectation, all 20 women would collectively start an enterprise, mm. invest the money in that enterprise. They would all market that product, mm. whatever, repay the loan to the bank hmm. and then earn a profit sufficient for each of their families. That sounds tricky. Doesn't it though? <laughs> Doesn't it though? Yeah, starting right? up with one person is hard. Exactly. <laughs> right? And that's when I found that um, no way, I mean it was a laughable idea where right. the women were concerned. The, the idea was absurd. How could all 20 of us, for instance, all of us have different circumstances. Somebody right. has a young child, somebody is already a wage worker. Many women were already agricultural laborers. Somebody else was helping her husband with a different shop in her home. Somebody else had was looking after ailing in loss. Mm. How can the 20 of us manage an enterprise? And also with really no meaningful training, uh, with no assistance in terms of finding markets, how are we going to make a success of this? But they did not have the option of saying, Tata bye bye to the scheme itself, right? They couldn't say, they couldn't like vote with their feet okay. and say that we won't take the loan, thank you very much. Why is that? Like because they wanted the loan and the subsidy, and right? They because need it's, it, so they... And they needed it okay. because it's also one way in which the bank is giving them a loan, fairly large loan, say 200,000 right. rupees to a single group. Uh, with a 50% subsidy, so they repay only 100,000. Yeah, so you would want it, yeah. How could they say no to yeah. it? They didn't have the option of refusing right. it. So they subverted the scheme. Mm. And much of my study became about this whole protocol of subversion. Mm. And what the women would do would be to fabricate evidence of an enterprise mm. management. So for instance, in one village, there was a brick kiln owner in the village, right? He had his own brick kiln. And it's running. And it's right. running because he's an entrepreneur, right? right? A micro, small businessman. Right. So they would approach him, share their dilemma with him, Pay him, they get all his documents, uh, pay him say 4,000 to 5,000 rupees right. which would go from their subsidy. Take a cut. Uh. Take lots of photographs and they would all be in their best saris. 
the banker would arrive on the day the bank manager the right. cohorts from the bank from the block development office and from the ngo right, right? it was always an ngo all of them would take pictures together with the brick kiln in the background so on paper it was perfect except the women had nothing to do Look with the with kiln that. thereafter okay right and this was the story in enterprise after enterprise and would who all would be complicit in this would this also be the bank manager absolutely oh, everybody so knew this whole... everybody knew this okay. so the only person who took a like a couple of days to catch on to this was me because i was the <laughs> outsider right okay and then i realized the story was not really about so are they able to use the sgsy scheme to actually make Get those out. you know right. uh, profits and so on but to understand this massive gap there is between development policies right. and realities on the field and what people have to do therefore to fit policy to their realities right right bit of an ethics question what sure. do you think is, is do you think this is okay How, what because sometimes i wonder again you're doing your best to create a policy that works but at the end of the day it's about what makes sense for them everyone is essentially a rational actor exactly in their context exactly so, would you exactly. be would you so, be more oh my god these people are subverting the system or would you be not at all not okay. at all because in their place i would have done exactly the same right. and really everybody was happy with the outcome right because the bankers remember uh, girish they also had a mandate right. they had a quota of so many loans to disburse before march 31st loans right. with subsidy because they are also part of the larger rural poverty alleviation mandate yeah. of governments public sector banks are not outside that logic yeah. the ngo obviously has an interest in ensuring, ensuring that the women, women that these yeah, loans right. actually work on the field right. as does the rural development administration right. they all need the paperwork that shows that the scheme is working the way it is working right. right and women want the money women want the loans and the subsidy at the interest rates that they could never get it for from the informal sector right, right? so this was the manner in which the scheme actually worked and what i did was to also show that well it was uh so yeah okay to go back to your ethics question i had to suspend judgment mm. right what i i had to be an empathetic presence mm. right and then as a so, trained social scientist i had to sort of go back to my readings to to then look for the kind of readings that would enable me to make sense of uh, what the dynamic actually is yeah how development policies can often be very often and this is hardly the exception yeah, yeah. and it's not just micro credit it's not only tamil nadu it's not only in the villages that i was studying this phenomenon but really there's this enormous literature on how policies are made and how policies have to be captured hijacked reworked subverted uh, so that for it to fit for it to fit yeah. and that's really part of the story of development mm. uh, and often large ngos right are as complicit as governments in creating policies that hardly speak to people's everyday lived realities mm. uh, so this was also a way of talking back to the sector to the development sector and saying that uh, while it might seem that it's a happy story and if everybody is happy then why it should it is a happy story right. but there was this enormous stress and tension that the women had to undergo in the process of fabricating these enterprises right. uh, and of Uh, you know providing sufficient evidence of enterprise management so right. there was payment of money there was a huge amount of running around there was all the labor and the efforts that went into it right. and it was really the women who were doing this single handed right and at the end of the day girish they had to pay everybody a cut also to secure their participation right so there were sev- several bankers who expected to be paid for overlooking scheme right. subversion mm-hmm. so there was always a sense uh women also felt this moral unease and therefore they had to pay their way to make the system work for them right so the story is layered right and uh well it was one of the many fascinating stories that i found mm. in the field and that's the thing about uh being uh in in research being in social sciences research and doing what we call immersive ethnography right okay. so you spend weeks and months you get to know people and then um you uh you understand why they make the decisions they do why they act the way they do and then you also recognize that in their place you would have done more or less the same things yeah so and we're all rational actors also so many so many directions i want to take this conversation in one Feel one free. deep dive before we move forward is is there any or in your research 
or your knowledge is there any uh, scheme that has been made with the actual ben beneficiary in mind what's a good poster child for a good scheme well you know the sfgs uh, not the not not the enterprise scheme but just the idea the the fact that women organized into grassroots collectives mm. um, have a right to make a claim upon the banking system so there was a scheme called uh, there still is called the sfg bank linkage scheme mm. which is to say that uh, banks must uh, once an sfg starts saving and then rotating its own money right. banks must give uh, women the loans they ask for well maybe not a huge amount so if they've got 1 lakh of savings then about 4 times 4 lakhs right. the bank could give them right and then a larger loan and so on now why did the scheme work because here any purpose the women used the money for was okay where the scheme itself was concerned right, right? Yeah. so the women did not even have to tell the banker why they needed the money and actually in a group of 20 every woman would have a different use for her loan money so let's yeah. say it, it worked out to 10,000 per woman right one of them school fees another medical expense a third person would pay the rent, a fourth person would go and redeem a piece of gold jewelry that she had pledged earlier, right? So that non-control, unconditional use of the loan was what women mm. uh, prioritized. You know, when I started my field work, even before my PhD research, when I would ask women, so what did you do with the loan of say 500 rupees? They would say, Saab toh, we ate the loan, right? right. That is to say food, uh, paying the bill, paying the essential bills, right? Yeah. So the fact that you must use your money, this extra money, hmm. that is obviously so vital for you to ensure that you essential survive. consumption goes on yeah. in any way that makes sense for you, yeah. the end user. That part of it, the SAGs got right, I must say, that women use their own money for whatever their own internal hmm. pool of capital for any purpose whatever that purpose they value. That makes sense for them. And under the linkage scheme, when they get a loan from the bank, uh, the banker is happy so long as you repay the loan right. and is not concerned with borrowing purpose. So those are the things that, you know, the SAGs. Right. It's, it's screaming agency and trust essentially yes. saying yes. like, don't yes. be patronistic. Know that people yes. know what's best for them. and Absolutely. Allow them to, Absolutely. You know. And allow them to make the decisions that they need to make yeah. in order to survive. Mm. So in fact, my paper on the SGSY is called Subverting Policy, Surviving Poverty. <laughs> Right. Okay. That in order to survive policy, uh, survive, so, poverty, survive poverty, you need to, to subvert the policy. policy. So yes. you need to really like, you know, catch policy by its throat and then twist it around and make it fit the shape that <laughs> makes Violent, sense. Violent but you. makes sense. <laughs> okay. So then the PhD and then what? what's the journey after? Um, so after the PhD, I think I worked for two years in a, uh, in a, as part of the journey, I must say, theater also happened in my life. Okay. And I became involved in Tamil theatre mm. and the crucial years of writing my PhD, the last two years of writing when writing seems interminably long and it's frustrating and it's not getting over, although you are writing and writing, uh, was when this beautiful play called Kala Kanaval, mm. A Dream of Time came into mm. my life. Um, and the play was um, uh, authored by V. Geeta, a feminist uh, right. uh, historian, Mangai, a playwright, um, very well known Excellent. activist and playwright uh, and then four fabulous women I'm proud to say I was one of them <laughs> <laughs> four fabulous women <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was that we um, uh, it was really a work of history so it was the voices of women from the 1920s 1930s oh, mm. and it's women uh, recovering their agency women women's voices uh, in uh, in history women writers women journalists women activists women uh, freedom fighters uh, but also Subramanya Bharati, but also Periyar. Mm. Uh, so all those streams that allowed women to sort of uh, exercise agency, also Gandhi. So that I must say the reason I'm mentioning it now is because it was so important for me uh, when I was writing my thesis to not feel that I was completely trapped inside my head, mm. which can happen. And now I'm very concerned because I've had four PhD research scholars. Right. Two of them submitted, defended everything, moved on in life, two more still with me. And I keep talking to them about how it's absolutely essential for them to do the things um, they need to do. One of them loves, uh, she's an illustrator, she loves painting and drawing, she's a trekker. So I'm like, go, go out and do that. Do the thing that keeps you happy, especially when you're locked inside your head. So this is this was the thing that gave me that fresh lease of life. Plus, mm -hmm. it was 
um, also the opportunity to read about these fantastic women in history. Uh, so that's, that also happened in my life. I don't want to forget that. And then the PhD was was done mm. and so on. And, uh, and then IIT Madras. Uh, and uh, IIT Madras, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. So I've really been in IIT Madras for about uh, 13, 13 and a half going, it's going to be now, yeah. 15 years now. Nice. And why IIT Madras? Um, once again How in Chennai. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I'm not there moving anywhere. There is something about all the Chennai Pavinale, people I know uh, who can't who leave have, the city. There is a certain magnetic pull of the city. <laughs> it's probably that. And I think it's extremely networked. I mean, you know everyone. It feels there right. is a sense of there is a sense of connectedness that I always feel right. among people who are from Chennai. Is that you? You could be right. You could be right. For me, it was also so. The other thing was, um, I was. By this time, I was married. Mm. Uh, my mother's health had also begun to take a turn for the worse. Mm. Uh, so those were the years, the IIT years were also the years I became actually a caregiver, really from 2010 onwards. Right. And I remained linked to these worlds outside the campus. Mm. For me, they were so important. And uh, it works and it when you were able when I to was, connect. To an course. extent, because there was this enormous... Right, yeah balance no there was amma and then there was my uh, there, were, there were meetings i wanted to be part of and campaigns i wanted to be yeah. part of outside of life but then there's also teaching and i had to commute every day to get to yeah. campus and well anyway that's a maybe a boring academic story <laughs> it's also an important one because i think it just it's very often easy to forget that every single person that we meet has a full life right there are things happening right 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 more I forget where what I was reflecting on recently, but I think this. Yeah, when I was speaking to different organizations recently, I realized that, for me, one of them treated me like a full human, mm -hmm. and one of them treated me in context of the mm. conversation that we were having, mm. and then that felt I sensed a difference mm. in how people, you know, uh, mm. see see you and how validated you feel for right. being a full human. Right, right, anyway, right. Uh, no, no, that's a great point because I think I was always very, very conscious and mindful that I must not become an ivory tower academic. Uh, and that while it was, um, I'm sure I also felt the pressure to be a productive academic, to be research active, to publish papers, book chapters, books, all of that, all that pressure. And also one feels that one wants to say something no, to the right. world and you this actually becomes know the things way, now. Yeah, yeah, this becomes the way that you can actually say it. So I also, once my PhD was done uh, and almost as soon as I defended my PhD, I, I joined IIT Madras, right? Um, so uh, I had this fire in my belly, which was that I was like this evangelist about <laughs> microcredit, right? right? Of course, with all the criticism about it. no. Yeah. So I wanted to get that voice out. And I wanted to write mm. as much as I could. Uh, so, uh, but then it's, it, those were also the years when I, whenever I went to a meeting and I had to introduce myself, I would say, I'm a caregiver, I'm a teacher, I'm a researcher. So I think I learned to put uh, the fact that I was caregiver first. Right. But that was a struggle mm -hmm. and I, that didn't come to me easily. Mm -hmm. uh, but over the years, I recognized that if it's going to be a big part of who I am and what I'm doing in the world, then it's only that fair to let people know that this is what I am. Mm -hmm. You know, why why hide it? Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, uh, uh, and therefore. Yeah. <laughs> and over these years, what helped you to manage between all of these different pieces? What were those either practices or just those choices you made that helped you to both be successful as you wanted to be and manage uh, personally as well as were you able to remain connected to the grassroots? To an extent, uh, okay. not as not as intensely as I would have liked for sure. Okay. Uh, so I, I remained connected in, uh, by constantly going back to the organizations that I used to be working with earlier. Okay. Uh, and, and the new organizations as well. Uh, by also selecting projects that would allow me to be in constant conversation with say trade unions. Okay. So after the SNGs, my other uh, piece of work after that, the one that followed was about women organizing, women workers in the lower rungs of the informal sector, organizing themselves into trade unions. Okay. And what are the challenges there? So women trade unions. That Basically, uh, yes, uh, uh, women in the informal, so women domestic workers, garment factory workers, construction workers, salt pan workers, fish workers, 
uh, and the trade unions that represent them. Sometimes led by women leaders, mm. sometimes there's a mixed composition. Um, I was looking at the question of uh, how does how solidar uh, solidarity get constructed and consolidated mm. uh, when there are so many pressures of fragmentation, right? right. So I think it was, um, I also selected this uh, also because it was, uh, it allowed me to stay in touch with and to make contacts with new groups constantly. Hmm. So there's a way in which my, uh, my interests uh, in activism also kept flowing into my research. And, uh, and therefore, I think I was able to keep this as, you Can know, keep the worlds together. Keep the worlds together. Although right. I've always felt I should do more proactively and I've always felt guilty about not doing enough right I've always felt that uh, I haven't beaten myself up but I've always felt or when I would say uh, go to a meeting and uh, it would be a great meeting let's say right and then I come back after a fantastic interaction and then I feel that oh that's the world that I want to be part of but then I'm coming back to teach in my classroom and my paper writing which is you know every paper that you write is a struggle every right. academic paper that you write is a struggle because you have to pitch it differently right and then there's just so many hours once again in which you're locked inside your head and mm. you're having conversations with yourself about does this sentence work or does this sentence work better and does this paragraph you know how do I play around with this so that the argument is unfolding more clearly mm. But all that is, the action is still inside your head, no? Mm. While this work of, uh, this world of uh, okay. activism, of change and so on is right here. I can touch it. I can feel it. I'm not living in some other city, in some other right. country. I'm right here. So I've always felt that impatience, mm. that longing to sort of get out, you know, and to be always in the action, as it were. Um, but at the same time, I don't think I allowed myself that completely. And why either, is that? Because I was... Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, mm. except that I arrived in academics uh, and also the act of reading and writing, I found calming, I guess, right. you know, um, there's something about writing also and being in conversation with yourself that calms you. Mm. And I think that also had that calming effect on me. So it sort of grounds you as well. Mm. Plus, it was a job. It was my livelihood. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, that I'm an academic also became a part of my identity. Uh, like I'm an activist used to be a part of my identity. Mm. And for all these reasons, then I think uh, the question of who am I? What do I want to be? Where do I want to spend more of my time and my energies? Mm. And, uh, you know, just how to distribute my energies mm. uh, and my priorities and what to value in life mm. uh, have always been constant questions. I've never taken them for granted, uh, Girish. I've never resolved them. I've never resolved them fully. Okay. I'm, I'm never at peace with the choices that I've made, uh, maybe over the last 10, 13 years, because I feel that I moved away from the world of activism, activism. really. Uh, uh, but um, I have made a home for myself in academics, in research, uh, and I continue to remain here mm. to this day. But who knows what the future holds? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just on that, I think... One question I have for you is as someone who has spent now decades connected with people who are different in many ways from your, whose lives are very different from your own. How, how does it feel to get in, get out from their lives like you're doing now? Earlier you used to be extremely connected, but also moving. And now you're in academia, but also connected to these trade unions, etc. One of the things, the reason I ask this is also one of the things that I know a lot of academics as well as a lot of people working in the development sector feel is the sense of I have the ability to help certain lives, but mm -hmm. I have the constraint in being able to walk through that entire journey with them. So that flitting in and out, how do you resolve it? How do you manage it in your way? I think you never resolve it really. Mm -hmm. I think you address it in different ways. Um, and I think it, it's, a, it's a constant uh, uh, um, struggle, it's a constant challenge and I think you keep working it out mm. and you work it out differently maybe from year to year uh, because the challenges are very different also. No? Can you um, make that a little clearer? Uh, it might be for instance that, um, uh, so let me give you an example like this, right? Um, so as my mother's health took a turn for the worse, I 
became really interested in understanding who she had been and how she had lived her life. Mm. And this was as her memories faded, right? So it was Alzheimer's dementia that she had. But like I told you, she was a feminist, a women's movements activist, a trade unionist, a communist leader. And um, I was gripped by this anxiety to preserve and record her stories, her writings, her life um, as a way of coming to terms with uh, losing, losing her it. in this really meaningless manner. Right? Um, and that became one of the most important projects I have undertaken. And it became... It was not only a labor of love, it was also that, but there was a lot of intellectual labor involved, yeah. right? So it became one of the projects that I did as an academic, as a researcher. Of course, I was helped. I had Gita, um, yeah. just like my, in my work, uh, in my research work, there were these fantastic trade unions doing enormous work, right? Mm. Uh, Gita Ramakrishnan, R. Gita, Sujata Modi. Um, the CITU's unions. Uh, so a lot of their strength and their energy and their passion and their commitment helped to keep my spirits up. Mm. So I think I'm also answering your question of how do you manage to hold it together? I managed to hold it together because I'm also feeding off that right. energy. Mm. Right? I'm also looking at them and feeling that longing for that world that I grew up in as a child. Right? right? Uh, and I'm feeling that so long as I remain connected to that world, I can make meaning inside my head, right? right? Um, so one of my important uh, uh, piece, one of the pieces of work that I've done over the last uh, 13 years uh, has been recording, writing about my mother's life, um, putting together her writings, uh, and then writing a memoir about her in Tamil, uh, and then uh, giving speeches about her life in which I'm tracing uh, you know, those uh, changing points mm -hmm. of uh, uh, her, her important trajectories when she decided that she was going to leave this and become that and move into this and move out of that and so on. And uh, that also became my contribution, I would say, to the field of labor studies and women's studies. Mm -hmm. Because my mother was a very important part of a number of vital movements, social right. movements in India. Right. And not writing about her, not, and she was also a person who was very, very self-effacing to the point where she constantly put herself down. Right. Something that always hurts a daughter when you see a mother do that, yeah. right? An otherwise strong mother. So I think for, for many reasons, I, this became a passion a project that became dearer to me mm. than any of my other pieces of writing and work that I was also doing um, mm. as, a, as a researcher, as an academic, mm. right? Um, so I think the... To, yeah, to address the question of how do you keep it all together? How do these different parts of your life speak to each other? I think in, in, in my case, they spoke to each other because when something bothered me and troubled me, I kind of grabbed it and then I thought about it and wrote about it. Mm. And in some ways, I made it as important in my life as any other piece of writing that I was doing as supervising my PhD scholars, as teaching a class, as grading mm -hmm. my essays. Right. And I, I didn't think it was any less important. If anything, it was only more important always. Mm. So I think that's that's how I managed to, managed to keep it bring together. it together, yeah. to keep it together. Yeah. So um, I do want to talk a little bit more about your mother. So what I know is that she was a veteran communist leader and right, activist. Right. And she uh, has been both a strong public figure and from what I can see an extremely influential figure in your own personal life. Absolutely. So can you just absolutely. tell us a little bit more about her and can we go a little deeper there? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, my mother was raised in Chennai. She was uh, born into a, a Tamil Brahmin family with no connections to politics or mm. public action or people's movements whatsoever when she was growing up. Uh, it, this was 1939 was the year of her birth. She was a brilliant student uh, though. And while her sister was older by a couple of years, was married off, even before she completed college, I think my mother held out, uh, went to Delhi, spent a year getting a degree uh, in public administration and then got a, a, a scholarship, worked for a scholarship to go because it was a middle class family. So there was no question of paying for her to get an education outside the country. Right. So she got a scholarship, went to the US in the 1960s and hey, it was US in the 1960s, right? right? the anti-Vietnam protests, uh, civil rights movements, uh, first Martin Luther King and then the more angry militant politics of Malcolm X, yeah. uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, the women's movements as well, right? The second wave women's movements. Right. And here was young Michael, all of 23 years old, arriving uh, to do a master's in public administration in uh, in Albany, New York. Okay. Right. And then, so she lived six years. In the heart of the storm. Then. Yes, yeah. in the heart of the storm, as it were. She became uh, an anti-imperialist. She became a Marxist. Uh, she worked for two years in the decolonization committee of the United Nations. Okay. So much of the work and research she did then was about, um, um, uh, you know, a, a large number of countries in Africa then were just uh, gaining independence from colonialism also. Mm. Um, so all of this clearly made her the person that she became. Mm. And when and she returned to India with a strong determination to do, to work in the, to work for social change in India, but mm. without a a clearer idea, idea of, what of what that what. meant mm. and within a couple of months of her returning of just maybe two or three months uh, Tamil Nadu witnessed this really ghastly incident of the, the massacre of Kirvan Mani okay. uh, the uh, village in which about 44 Dalit landless agricultural laborers most of them women and children were burnt alive inside a hut uh, and this was because there had been uh, years of agrarian conflict between uh, land uh, land right. owners and the landless the poor in the region, uh, right? So Amma then mightily then visited Kiran Mani within a week of the incident in the company of Krishna Mal Jagannathan, another veteran Gandhian leader, right. and that uh, uh, sort of shocked her to her to the very to her very essence, and it gave her the very strong conviction that there must be fundamental underlying structural change. It can't be superficial change, right? Mm. We must look at who has power, who has land, who owns wealth. So there must be a sort of a churning from um, below as it were. And that led her to find the Communist Party, the CPIM, uh, and uh, and then began her uh, uh, involvement in some of the large massive trade union struggles of mm. the 1970s when one major company after the other uh, in the city of Chennai was uh, having these convulsions because of labor unions and strikes, right. right? And she was one of the prominent faces, one of the leading figures in the trade union movement. And then from the 80s onwards or even from the mid 70s onwards with the All India Democratic Women's Association being created, she was also one of the leading figures in, the, in organizing working class women especially around issues of access to food, the public distribution system, ration shops, the working of ration shops. There was one a big protest that she was part of in the early 1980s. I think the year was 1981, mm. uh, when um, uh, women surrounded the assembly and forced M.G. Ramachandran, the chief minister, to step out and speak with them for about one and a half hours. Mm. And he promised uh, that water would be supplied to their areas and that the public distribution system would be, you know, made, made right. would be improved. So really food uh, and water because when those are the essentials that women are always held responsible for right, right. they have to provide right so that was my mother and mm. as you can see clearly when i was growing up it was a household in which there was no boundary between the world outside and home or there was no office space i didn't think amma went to an office right, right? it was all in the same space. it was all in the same space and the neighborhood was where we lived was one where Anybody would knock on our door any time of right. the night of the day seeking help, saying the police has come and picked up a woman, uh, 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 can you help? And she would be calling the police commissioner saying, how can you detain a woman in a police station after 6 p.m.? Right. You have no right to do that. Uh, or uh, a woman and her mother once showed up in our doorstep and uh, they were fleeing the woman's abusive husband. Hmm. So spent the night at our home and mother got them help the next morning. So this was really her world. Although, of course, I mean, I took this all for granted when I was growing up. This was, was the world that you knew. So it was the world. It was the only world I knew. Yeah. Right. So I just took it all as a matter of, uh, you know, this is my mum. This is how she is right. always. And it's really uh, only when I became much older and also sadly after I began to lose her, that I began to look at her more closely and look at her life more closely. And uh, I did that almost compulsively. Hmm. Uh, I couldn't bear to look away then, right? So that's really, um, um, yeah, that's really. And if I can just, I had a few questions around. Go ahead, go ahead. One of the things that I only recently realized is that, you know, I know about the First World War. I know about the Second World War. And then there is a big uh, 
a passing mention of a cold war that mm-hmm. went on for 40 mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. at the end of which we had mm-hmm. you know capitalism winning and communism mm-hmm. losing mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. and i think the period that your mother was active was when right, things right, you know the right. war was still on yeah and and the uh, and no till she was active till about 2008 okay long after then so 40 years totally i think just from i think one of the things that i have been exploring understanding is just how little i know about communism marxism etc mm. and the general narratives we have heard mm. growing up mm. it doesn't work you know ussr failed and communism mm. therefore doesn't mm. work um mm. can you help and i know that will be true of many people who are listening as well so can mm. you elaborate a little bit more around what you think people should know about mm. the things that your mother stood for the beliefs mm. that were underlying mm. 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 so so this is obviously something that my mother also grappled with in the mm. sense that the uh, you know the collapse of the soviet union and the sort of spectacular collapse as it were right. of uh, eastern europe socialist governments yeah. in eastern europe uh, this was something that shook shook up every communist uh, mm. activist and leader across the world and certainly in countries like india in which uh, the communist movements has had very deep roots in terms of building unions of uh, the young of peasants of landless agricultural laborers of mm. women of students etc in different amongst different sections of the population right uh, and uh, the the struggles at the at the uh, at the grassroots mm. would be for very basic very essential issues like right. the wages the decent wage the 8 hour working day mm. uh, the freedom from sexual violence and sexual exploitation in the workplace uh you know the 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 right to dignity of the worker the right to dignity of the woman worker mm. uh right and uh, or the fight against uh caste uh, uh violence, violence the fight against uh, caste uh, atrocities mm. caste oppression right uh, the fight against untouchability related practices so while their concerns and their issues all of which my mother all these battles that i mentioned that my mm. mother was very much a part of that she wrote about spoke about fought for on the streets um on the one hand were uh, raging right. right but on the other hand the larger vision that communists had over the world right, right? which was revolution. yeah the idea of the soviet union as um um you know a sort of a socialist as an alternative as a possible alternative of a more egalitarian world of a more humane world of perhaps a kinder world mm. right that vision was suddenly mm. no longer there so there certainly was a moment of reckoning okay and i think um, in other i mean in 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 say the west for instance there was already turning away from elements of stalinism for sure right right uh but then the question really was then how does one derive one's meaning really and continue to remain hopeful and fight for, for a own. world that is once again egalitarian in which uh, economic justice is part of the future social justice is part of the future and gender justice is very much part of the future right if you right. want to bring it all together um what what is the vision that you anchor on for emancipation of uh, of uh, people that you hold on to right and i don't think there is an answer that has emerged uh, you right. know completely but i think um, um left uh, activists are really working it out in ma- very many different ways girish mm-hmm. uh, and uh, part of it is to also in some cases go back to socialist texts to to go back to histories of socialism that continue to inspire not everything about it not many of the actions of say governments like the soviet union or eastern european governments uh, then there's also always going to be the question of what of civil liberties in a socialist state right mm. does the individual not matter how do you prevent a state from becoming totalitarian right even if it says that it's working in the interest of the large masses right there's always the state no the state is has enormous power mm. how do you moment. deal with that so these are questions that i think generations of uh, people with an interest in uh, in uh, let's say social change continue to ask themselves mm. um and i have a feeling that if my mother has if my mother's illness had not really you know taken that turn she would have continued to write about and face some of these questions in her characteristic right. very forthright manner uh but sadly that is something that <laughs> we don't yeah. uh she hasn't really been able to reflect on yeah there was actually one follow up question i had to that uh, mm, mm, which mm. was how what is your sense on where society is today and where it's headed 
because mm-hmm. on one side i'm reading news that things are better there mm-hmm. is uh, mm-hmm. that the world is getting better and there is no mm-hmm. doubt about it and mm-hmm. in fact we're all doing extremely well mm-hmm. both as a country and as a world mm-hmm. and on the other side you also hear that trickle down doesn't work you mm-hmm. know we've mm-hmm. not crossed the targets that we wanted to mm-hmm. you know things are at an all time things are as they were it's just mm-hmm. less seen more mm-hmm. hidden right or more out of sight mm-hmm. what's your take mm-hmm. so that's a very very large question with a uh, lot of generalizations possible which <laughs> 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 so i would say um well trickle down certainly doesn't work okay uh mm. that was busted you know so there's there's no question of trickle down uh but you know one positive uh, i i would think facet since the 2000s at least has been the extent to which um, large numbers of social movements have uh, forefronted questions of uh, uh, very basic forms of justice whether it's uh, caste related anti caste uh, movements or movements for uh, the right to information food absolutely uh, so uh, there's been an effort to build a sense of citizenship around uh, access to very basic health care services uh, access to education holding the state to account right and i would say i'm talking about uh, movements like the RP, the right to information, information movement i'm talking about the growing manner in which uh, dalit uh, movements dalit rights movements across the country uh, have uh, foregrounded the questions of continuing uh, caste violence practices um so i would say that i mean there's no there's no need to lament the fact that there is nothing happening in india so to speak right mm. there are social movements uh they are vibrant uh and they are making demands both of civil society and of the state mm. right so where anti caste movements are concerned the questions they are asking are directed as much to civil society you know as they are to the state right right and uh, um so i i would say that uh, there needs there does not have to be a sense of uh, uh defeatism mm. or pessimism um that things have worsened or the more you know the more things uh, change the more they remain the same i don't think that's true uh and i um i think there are uh, uh, or, or even just if you were to take uh, dialogues around gender justice the mm. way they have changed and transformed after uh the death of nirbhaya post uh, 2012 with large numbers of young men and young women from different parts of the country uh now constantly writing about issues of uh, gender justice in various forms in their own languages there's mm. no nobody is going to use a politically correct language all the time right right uh so uh, uh there is there are many many signs of hope so i would not uh, i wouldn't uh, i i i wouldn't feel completely hopeless but if i may just nudge a little on that right. why would you not say that the more things change the more they stay the same because i would think that if i put on a contrarian hat mm. this has been i mean mm. the fact that you have more movements is only mm. representative mm. of there is still injustice so strongly in fact getting right. stronger right right so right 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 so how would you see that uh, well i would say that uh, th- that battle is always going to remain uh, girish that okay. battle is always going to remain that you're going to always going to have to organize against protest and call out various entrenched forms of, forms of discrimination right mm. uh and uh, that's uh, that's really never going to go away mm. because uh, changes always happen in in response to uh powerful undercurrents from below and i think we often don't see that those undercurrents from below are as important as what may seem to be benevolent policy policy actions from above right so mm. those undercurrents from below are going to be absolutely essential to keep the pressure on states to deliver i mean there's something about the more things i mean the, the way you put that 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 seems to suggest that we're really not moving at all in any direction and i don't hold with that you know sure uh, so uh. um i think it's uh, i mean an absolute uh, truth that there are many forms of uh, civil liberties that could always be at danger mm. in india the world over and that are certainly at danger in india today and that's what i think and there's many many moments when i feel very deeply frustrated when i look at the state of democracy in india mm. but uh, that's the uh, i don't want to lose hope 
I don't want to give in to despair. Mm. And I think I mustn't lose hope. Uh, so um, uh, I I feel that every battle is is waiting to still be fought in different forms, uh, in ways that make sense today that may not necessarily have made sense about 20 years mm. ago. Uh, and I'm hoping always to have opportunities to have the space and energies in my life to be a part of those battles mm. one way or the other, whether I'm in a university, whether I'm not in a university, uh, in whatever way, right, that I am part of that. I, I, I'm really hoping to have the energy to fight. Mm. And if I were to ask you one question, if I am kind of be being benefited by the system as it is currently, right, why should I struggle for things that are not mine? Right, right, right. If, if again, and I'm asking for a general person, yeah. why should they care about something that doesn't affect them today? Right, right. Um, because I think everything affects us, no? In some ways, for instance, now supposing I think that I am safe, right? Because I have middle and upper middle class privileges, right? And I think uh, that I have an income, so I have access to private transport. Uh, so the whole question of uh, some uh, heinous forms of violence that women without my privileges face is not my problem. But there is a way in which it is always present in my consciousness. Hmm. Uh, and I, I don't think it's only because I'm my Tini's daughter. And I, I know this from uh, large numbers of women who feel uh, that when they hear about some gruesome case of violence against a woman and then they can actually feel that, that sense of uh, pain and grief and hurt in their own bodies, right? Mm. It's almost like a collective body that is uh, that is hurting, that is wounded, that mm. is angry, mm. that is resisting. But then you have not been hurt, mm. right? And you perhaps will never be uh, because you were not in the position of that woman who was so extremely vulnerable right. uh, because of either her caste position or her class position and who was very, very badly hurt. Uh, but even so you suffer, don't you? So then that connects you know, to another human mm. uh, and, and that's when you feel that you can't turn away, you can't just feel that uh, it doesn't matter to you. Mm. Uh, there's, there's, there's no place of uh, perfect safety for any of us. No? And also this is the other thing I also talk about sometimes in my, um, when I talk to my students that to be human is to, to care very deeply right is to care very deeply and if you don't care deeply why should you care well if you don't care i feel you're not human enough as deeply as you could be right there's a part of your own humanity that you um that you neglect is a part of your own humanity that Denied. you don't honor mm -hmm. that you don't uh, cultivate uh, and that just makes you less than human mm -hmm. it's it's not about your being somebody else's savior. In fact, don't be anybody's savior. You can, you can't be, and you nor must you try to. But I think you have to live um, in the fullest possible uh, human way that you can, and mm. to be a human in every, in the fullest way, in the deepest way that it is imaginable to be human. You have to care very deeply about what happens to others around you. You have to care deeply about the planet, right? And you have to feel that connection. And how do you and learn to care? Um, and I ask this in the context of okay, a lot okay. of the time, again, to to the point of how you were talking about the collective pain that you were feeling, mm, uh, it comes when you know what it means to be vulnerable and you are hearing echoes of that mm, in the situation mm, and wondering what if it were me in some mm, sense, right? Mm, Very often, my understanding, at least now, is that when you are, let's say, upper caste male, privileged mm. in all ways, mm. it's often hard to be able to relate to what it means to be vulnerable because mm. you probably mm. have never been. Mm. You haven't felt unsafe when you walked in the mm. night in the dark. Mm. Right, right, so, right, right, right. And right, then right. when your lived experience has not added Absolute. up to theirs, yeah, yeah. how do you learn to care? So, um, so it's not only because what if it were me, right? right. So even if, it, if this could never be me, I'm still angry and I'm still deeply upset and I'm still hurting and I still want to act and I still want to speak. Mm. Uh, even if this, now how do you learn it? How do you acquire it? Ah, what a tough question that is. 
because if you, because if, if, if if they if someone who's listening gets what you're many, saying but there are so it. many stories of people who who have not personally uh themselves been um you know uh, for whatever reason vulnerable who have not suffered any form of uh, economic or social disadvantage and who have still deeply deeply cared yeah. and i think it's maybe personal histories uh, uh that uh, that are the turning point like as was the case in mightley's life yeah. uh and uh, but how do you learn to you know that's a it's not even a question that i know how to answer yeah. really i know no there is perhaps no good answer here but for me that right. has been one of the questions which is right 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 in the worlds that i traverse through right the system yeah, that you yeah. are in gives you a certain cool aid that you start believing right, and right, you start right. passionately believing yeah yeah and yeah when i then again when i now meet people from different mm. worlds from mm. where i am mm. uh, at different points in the spectrum of understanding what causes social change mm. for me mm. there is a sense of how do i even begin to explain to you mm. my point of yeah. view yeah and i'm yeah. sure you yeah. would have felt yeah. that yeah. so and that's what i mean right. by say you care right. because right. you understand right. about right. what you have what you care about yes yes art and books okay so okay. i think reading um other perspectives other points of view other lived experiences uh, other stories other biographies autobiographies mm. um uh, and uh, and then art in all mm. its forms right uh, that can um um make other worlds other universes even mm. seem real to you seem alive to you in a manner that you uh your conscience is awakened mm. in a manner that you want to respond in a manner that you want to put yourself in somebody else's shoes mm. um uh and uh that's i think the purpose of storytelling no really and i think the purpose of all storytelling whether it's a play a uh, a novel whether it's non fiction whether it's fiction mm. um uh, a slice of somebody else's life and history otherwise why do you read about lives that are not like your own right uh, and that's the purpose of all other forms of creation it could be dance it could be theater uh, so i think the potential there is in stories that are told through all these forms mm. of uh, of writing of speaking of dancing of singing right um that do that show you precisely this that there are many many ways many many stories around you and how can you live as if your reality were the were the okay. only one and maybe right? what i'm taking away is exposure simulated or otherwise right because right right i do think that me again that if i zoom out from what art and stories do yeah, they expose yeah. you to other other lives other stories exactly, and so exactly exactly maybe that could be exactly. one way to make people my care. classrooms for instance yeah. are places where there's constantly uh, you know engagement with ideas right yeah. um Yeah. Yeah. Pick up a book and read, you know? Pick up. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And I found this uh, little wooden box with my grandmother's writings. Why must I write? She says in 1949. Uh why should I write about who am I, you know? but i have a story to tell mm. the bank says we want our own loan return that your father in law took your husband took then the women say to the bank but you know treat us as credit worthy agents in our right. own right we are not so and so's daughters and wives and mothers right uh, mm. but when it comes to their own internal micro capital then women turn the bankers gaze on each other 